Have we got the signal from? Okay. We're grateful this morning that we have, we've awakened to a new day with the love of Christ in our hearts. We're in this great moment. We're going to discuss here uh, the greatest problem that God faces in this final hour. And that's the apostasy mm. that began before the turn of the century in our rejection of the 1888 message, Righteousness by Faith, and has progressively moved forward until we're in, in a, such a, a terrible situation today. It's hard for God to recognize what he told us to do. Now, Colin, will you open with prayer? Let us kneel. Our Heavenly Father, we kneel before Thee because Thou art the potentate of the universe, yes. the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes. And we are but dust, mm. fashioned by the Creator, mm. but then fallen. And that's why we kneel before Thee. Oh, Lord, we pray that thy Holy Spirit will be in our midst, that his presence will minister to every heart and mind, yes. that the lessons to be learned will be learned well by each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, Russell, if you'll begin by presenting to us the problems that we face in this great hour when we see the apostasy that is circumventing the world and the church. When we commenced this round table two days ago, for those who are not here, I'll just recapitulate. We made the point that every offshoot, every error that has been introduced into the Seventh-day Adventist church has caused virtually no problem, a little problem here and there, to the church unless it was accepted by the General Conference. We went through quite a number of these. We showed, uh, by way of example, the new theology, which now dominates our church. Six times it took the devil to bring that in. Five times rejected by the General Conference, and it got nowhere. Sixth time accepted by the General Conference, and now it is worldwide and the dominant faith being preached on the Holy Sabbath day, which has already commenced in the South Pacific as the Sabbath is already in there right now. And uh, I mentioned, Canwright was the first one to bring it in, rejected. Then Ballinger, rejected. Then Conradi, rejected. And then the devil went to Australia. Fletcher, rejected. Grieve rejected. And then came the sixth and fatal one, Desmond Ford. Accepted, and I didn't tell you what the South Pacific Division of the General Conference, again emphasizing the divisions are General Conference. They're not a level of our church. And uh, what they said, and I was one who was there, it was my privilege to be one of the 16 who took Desmond Ford before the Biblical Research Institute on February 3 and 4 in 1976. And uh, I was there with all these luminaries, union presidents, conference presidents, all now retired, standing for the mighty truths of God. They were missionaries too, an evangelist, the best evangelist we ever had in the South Pacific. They knew the truth and they were devastated as this new theology came in under Desmond Ford. And then we took it to the Biblical Research Institute. All the leaders of the division were there, including the president and secretary and so forth. The union presidents were there. And to our devastation, despite the fact that Desmond Ford was the slickest and uh, probably most brilliant person there, he could not stand up against those old pastors who actually knew what it was like to get their trousers wet in baptismal fonts. It's far easier, remember, 
to stand up and lecture to students who are depending on you for an A or a B or whatever and get them to ex uh, accept what you're saying than people who are not of our faith who owe us nothing except eternal life is their result if they accept it. And uh, these men, in the end, left forward saying, well, if you think I'm a heretic, what about, and then he quotes some other false Seventh-day Adventist theologian or writer, you see, and they were also into apostasy. As a result, we... Tell them of J.W. Kent. And uh, I, perhaps I ought to tell you, the one who led us was Pastor J.W. Kent, the first conference president. He was 86 at this time, and I was just in my early 40s. And uh, we, we don't remember a, general co a, a conference president before J.W. Kent in the North New South Wales Conference where we were born. And then he became president of the Western Australian Conference and then of the South Australian Conference. And he was a mighty evangelist that brought George Burnside, our, who became our greatest evangelist ever, into the truth when he was running a campaign in Christchurch in the South Island of New Zealand. And there was no more eloquent man, but here he was, an old warrior for truth, 86 years of age, and I'll still remember him walking over to Des Ford in that meeting and holding up his Bible and he said, Des, I die for that which is in this word, these certainties, but I would not shed one corpuscle of my blood for all the ifs, buts, and maybes you've given us today. I tell you, don't think that those discussions were not electric. It was one of the most electric meetings I've ever been in. And then later on he stood up and he said to Des, I've defended the precious Adventist truth. Remember, he's 86 at this stage but still full of zeal. He died at 93 in, in 1983. And he said, I, he said, I've defended this precious Adventist faith against ministers of every color and every stripe. He wasn't meaning racial color. He meant every wind, uh, every religion that you could imagine virtually. But he said, I never dreamed that in the last days of my life, I'd have to defend it against a credentialed, ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I tell you, the word electric understates it. And then there was the godly pastor, J.B. Keith, twice a union president, and John Keith was the most godly union president it was ever my privilege uh, to uh, work under. And uh, Pastor Keith... Another New Zealand, you'd be surprised, all the New Zealanders on both sides of the fence because the division president, which we mentioned earlier, Pastor Naden, he was a New Zealander, and uh, also Pastor Burnside, who opposed uh, the new theology, he was a New Zealander. Pastor J.B. Keith was a, a New Zealander, and he'd been raised as a Plymouth Brethren. You don't hear of that religion uh, much here in America, but in in British countries, it's not a big religion, but of course, it has had more effect upon the whole of Protestantism in this country. It's been Plymouth Brethren that brought in the rubbish that's believed by evangelical Protestantism today. It was the founder of that, John Darby, who was originally an Anglican priest and then went to Plymouth in England and started what he called the Plymouth Brethren. And he brought in this nonsense that the Antichrist is a man at the end of time. He brought in the rapture and all those things which have destroyed Protestantism because it was all put in to the Schofield Bible and that dominated the thinking in the notes of the Schofield Bible. So although it is not a well-known church today, Protestantism has been destroyed by it in this country more than any other country of the world without really knowing it. And he was raised a Plymouth Brethren. And he and his mother accepted the faith when he was a late teenager. And he heard Ford bringing it back because Ford studied under a Plymouth Brethren professor at the University of Manchester in England in his theology doctorate. 
And J.B. Keith listened to this wretched error that he'd rejected as a young man. And he's always a quiet, considered man in his preaching. Dignified. Very dignified was John B. Keith. And he, I never th thought I'd see the days when I'd see the tears trickling down his old cheeks. And uh, I'll never forget him saying, Death, as a young man, I left that terrible dense darkness for the glorious light of the Seventh-day Adventist faith. And you dare now to bring that back to us as if it is new light for God's people. Brothers and sisters, you would have been blessed if you'd been there and heard those old pastors as they stood. And when I took part in the uh, funeral service of Pastor O.K. Anderson back in May in 2001, the only one of those 11 pastors that were at that meeting standing for truth who survived into the 21st century, the younger brother of one of those who brought the new theology to prominence, Roy Allen Anderson, I think many of you have heard of him. He was the ministerial secretary, another Australian, of course, was a ministerial secretary of the General Conference, and he and Froome were the most um, prominent in destroying the faith with the Martin Barnhouse uh, dialogue and with that dreadful book that was put out by the General Conference, Seventh-day Adventists answer questions on doctrine. And, uh, but his younger brother, O.K. Anderson, whose parents, of course, have been brought in by the actual ministry of Sister White way back in 1895 in Victoria, that old O.K. Anderson stood and stood strongly. And at that funeral... I reminded, and there were a lot of ministers there who have not stood the test of the faith. They didn't like what I said, but I said it kindly. I said, back in 1976, 25 years ago, the great theme of Des Ford and his supporters was we need a whole lot more funerals in the Seventh-day Adventist church. In other words, let's get rid of all these old pastors and then we'll be able to have control. And here was the last one of the 11. And I could hardly control my emotions as I said, and at last their wish has been fulfilled. And I named the 11 men who stood so nobly one by one. There was the last one. And as I did the interment service for dear old Orman Keith Anderson, 95 years of age, it was one of the days of the most enormous sorrow because Colin and I, as boys, had been, when he carried out his great evangelistic series in the city of Newcastle, our birth. We were the little lads going around letterboxing. And he was such a lovely evangelist. He, uh, for his evangelistic uh, meetings. And he'd come to us and say, boys, I've got good news for you. You know where you put it? We've got people coming from that area. Oh, Colin and I, you know, we're about 13, 14. We were part of the team. We were. We were so ego involved. But now he rests, awaiting the call of the Lord. And only three of the 16 remain. I was not an ordained minister at that time, and the other two are lay people. Now, my brothers and sisters, we have been showing that the General Conference led out in the apostasy in 1888, and we've never recovered. That's why we're in such a mess on righteousness by faith. And then came 1903, when it was decided that we would have a uh, hierarchical system, which Sister White said was the greatest disappointment of a lot, led by the General Conference. And then the rejection of self-supporting work after that time by Elder Daniels and others, that has caused terrific 
um, lost to the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And then yesterday, we spoke about how during the Second First World War, the General Conference permitted the nations of Europe to tell their governments that it was not in any way an error or a breach of the commandments to break the Sabbath or to break the Sixth Commandment. And as a result, we know how weak Seventh-day Adventism became in Europe. As a result, that was under Conradi. And then we took up the 1919 Bible Conference. It's no mistake our brother, a pastor, a Perozo, um, said this morning, and he read that statement, that the last um, event would be before the close of probation was discarding the testimonies of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, the pattern was set by men like A.G. Daniels and W.W. Prescott and others at that 1919 Bible conference when they doubted Sister White's inspiration. And so we come today to 1930 and the period, as I said yesterday, of the Watson years, Pastor Charles Watson, the first non-American citizen ever to be General Conference President. Yes, there was one man not born in America, and that was Pastor Olson, who was the president from 89 till 97, 1889 to 1897, but he'd had taken, he'd come over at five years of age from Norway, and he was, of course, the, um, uh, an American citizen by the time he became a General Conference president. But uh, Charles Watson was an Australian and still was. And there's probably only one reason why he was selected, and that was because of Wall Street's collapse in 1929. Because before becoming a convert to Adventism, he was a very successful businessman and a very astute accountant. He was well known to be excellent in finances. And what the General Conference needed when there was a plunge in tithes and offerings at the economic depression, and those who uh, are a bit younger than we are probably do not know how terrible it was in Australia. 40% of the workforce on uh, unemployment. 40%, that's how bad it was. We lived through it as little boys. But they saw in Pastor, um, uh, in Pastor Watson a man who may be able to bring financial stability to the General Conference in this t terrible time. He had been, of course, a president of a conference in Australia. He had been a treasurer, of the, uh, a treasurer in the General Conference and he had been a vice president of the General Conference, so he had some credentials. Now, I, although I've seen him before he died, I did not know the man uh, well. I knew his son, but I didn't know him well. And I don't want to put all the responsibility, because one man can't do it all. But three devastating things happened in that period, 1930 to 1936. Worst of all, maybe not, was the church manual came in. Then there was accreditation of our colleges. And thirdly, the decision to set up seminary. Because seminaries are the most diabolical destroyers of truth you could ever construct. Are these seminaries. And they all came in in what I have termed the Watson years, 1930 to 1936. Now I'll pass over uh, to Colin to start speaking about the church manual and the saga. Well, as we began this, this devastating situation, I, I knew, I knew R.A. R. Anderson. I knew also Froome. I knew R.A. Anderson better. I didn't know Reed, but these three men were the men that were chosen to meet with Barnhouse and Martin. And what many people don't know is that these men went to the White Estates and because of the pressure that Barnhouse and Martin was putting on them, they went to the White Estates and suggested that they put uh, footnotes in Ellen White's writings on two subjects, and that was the nature of Christ and the atonement. Because these were the, these were the, the statements that Barnhouse and Martin, 
You feel that the, the, that the coma is still going on. We can't accept that. You're not Christian. And then the nature of Christ, they wouldn't accept that he had a fallen nature. And praise, uh, uh, Pastor Olson was the chairman of, of the thing. When he came back from Europe, he refused to let that happen. Those footnotes never went in to explain some of this, the, 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 the emphasis upon these two precious, uh, these two precious uh, important doctrines of our church. Now, Colin, take it up from there. Before I get to the manual, I, I want to explain to each one of you here why Russell and I are so passionate about bringing this history forward and presenting it. We believe we have a very critical mandate to do that. We know that there are no two people in Adventism anywhere in the world that could have written, for example, the book, The Gathering Storm on the Storm Burst. If you haven't read that book, brethren and sisters, that is a must if you're going to understand. You're going to fail in the future if you don't learn the lessons of the past and if you don't know the lessons of the past. When I was um, chairman of the, uh, the uh, education department of Avondale College, 1965 to 1969 inclusive, five years, I was seeing what was happening in the classrooms of Avondale College. And I made a plea one day in the faculty meeting, pleading with my fellow faculty members. Now, I was still fairly young in my early 30s at that time. And there are many more senior professors there than I was. But I said, brethren, remember what we preach in our classes today will be preached in the pulpits tomorrow and will be believed by our people the day after tomorrow. Of course, that was a concentration of the, the situation. That was a prediction that was to come true with fearful accuracy in the South Pacific. They were being taught error in the classroom. They would go out and preach it in the pulpits and the passive, non-studying members would accept it as if it was the truth of the gospel. And uh, I would have hoped that my plea that day in the faculty would have done something to wake some of our professors up and that included Desmond Ford and a number of the other men that were preaching error to the students, like Russell Kranz and Chubby Moles. All three, in their uniquely different way, were teaching errors to the generation of pastors. Is it any wonder in the 1980s, 180 pastors left the ministry, almost all of them from that vintage? Some of them became. Sunday church pastors. Some went into other churches. Some left Christianity altogether. Now, you might say 180 doesn't sound that much in a decade, but when you've got a small uh, number of pastors, as we do in the South Pacific, compared with North America, that was a huge carnage amongst the pastors in, in that country. But you know, but, as... Could I just mention one thing? One of those pastors obtained his PhD degree from Monash University in Melbourne on the sociology of, and he, he went around all, it was a little over 180, on the sociology of that carnage. So we know a great deal about it from his thesis. Yes, well, you know, these wonderful pastors that Russell has talked about, leaders, these were the men that we admired and uh, as boys and then we, we were joining them as we became more mature in our life and they were looking to us and one day oh there must have been maybe a dozen of these old pastors retired pastors mission presidents conference presidents division workers union presidents they suddenly focused on Russell and myself we were, on the average, three and a half decades younger than they were. We were just boys to them. 
even though we were now in our early 40s. And they turned to us with great burden. We're soon going to pass away. We don't have much longer on this earth. Russell and Colin, will you promise us that you'll keep the flame of truth alive? It brings tears to my eyes just recalling that situation. If you knew these men, the burden, the earnestness, as they saw their own lives ebbing away, and they were wanted to be certain that this truth would not be lost to these people. Russell and I both promised them that with the grace of God, we would stand and be faithful. We didn't know all then what that would mean in terms of opportunity opposition and vilification and destruction of reputations all those things but we realize that Jesus is made of no reputation so who are we to worry about our reputation I'm zealous of my character but don't fight for your reputation but you know our father what a godly man he was you've met him Ron Several times. Yeah. What a model he was to his sons. And he was dying. He died in 1987. We just reached 97. We just reached our 64th birthday three days before he died. Not everyone has a father until they're 64 years of age. But we were. And we were born when both our parents were 21 years of age. So they weren't very old when we were born. And I, Russell was still in America before going back to Australia. He did have the opportunity of meeting Dad, what, once or twice? Twice. Twice after that. I did not have a chance to meet him again. But we called him up from Maryland, from Russell's son's home. And our dad partway through that conversation just a couple of months from death said boys we were 64 but we were still boys boys I want you to promise me you'll continue to preach what you're preaching now I tell you I can't forget those challenges and brethren and sisters if we don't have that passion if we don't have that dedication ourselves to doing that, caring not for our reputations, caring not for what the consequences are, but knowing that we're doing what God wants us to do, that's all God can ask of us. But he asks all of that of us, every one of us here. So let us look at this church manual situation. You know, almost certainly, that the church functioned for decade after decade without a church manual. Because we had read the counsel of the Lord when we were young men going to the crusades in fact youth and even children going to the crusades every year we went to these six month long crusades because our parents weren't the type that went the first night we went every night I tell you we wouldn't have missed that for the world evangelist after evangelist six month crusades and we'd hear them thunder out The Bible and the Bible alone is our foundation of all faith and practice. How many have heard that? That comes from the servant of the Lord. Slightly different words, but the same message. We have no creed but the Bible. And they'd hold up the Bible to say that the Bible is the foundation of every truth of the Seventh-day Adventist faith. 
and people responded to that. They believed that the Bible was God's word. And this is the only church in Christendom that truly follows the word of God. Satan knew that too. And so his focus was upon this church. Therefore, they wouldn't have a creed. They wouldn't put out a 27 fundamental statement of beliefs. Or statement of fundamental beliefs? Not at all. We had the Bible, not some man-made contraction of the word of God or of the truth. The whole of the Bible. They believed that every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God was meat and drink for God's people. They believed that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Listen, brethren and sisters, I still believe that today. Amen. And therefore, no manual was ever devised when we became a denominated church in 1863. But within 20 years, Satan was moving on the minds of some Seventh-day Adventists, and they were saying, we need a manual. The other churches have it. Sounds like the Israelites had said, we need a king like the other nations. We need a manual like the other churches. Well, we had our manual the an infallible word of God and that's all we need well the general conference under great pressure General uh, George Butler was the president at that time 1883 set up a an ad hoc committee that means a committee that would stand only to cover one matter and that was whether we should develop a church manual and a very distinguished committee was chosen well, we're very fortunate that the uh, report of that church uh, manual committee is extant. It was written up in the November 20 issue of the Review and Herald, a full report, 1883, November 20, 1883. Anyone could get hold of it here. I'm going to read to you the, the middle part of that report, which is the center to what they said. By the way, I hope everyone has this book. It's a tremendous book, isn't it? How can any Adventist, and if our self-supporting churches or, or groups would study this book, they wouldn't be making all the same mistakes that the, the denominational churches are making. Better name it. It's organizational stru structure and apostasy. People say, well, I don't worry about that. I tell you that's one of the greatest problems in our church today. It is the unanimous opinion of the committee appointed to consider the matter of a church manual that it would not be advisable to have a church manual, 1883. We consider it unnecessary because we already have surmounted the greatest difficulties connected with church organization without one. And perfect harmony exists among us on this subject. I wish we could say that today. Perfect harmony, 1883. Oh, how wise the leaders of the past were. How unwise are the leaders of today. And then again, it went on to say, it would seem to many like a step towards the formation of a creed or a discipline other than the Bible, something we have always been opposed to as a denomination. If we had one, we fear many, especially those commencing to preach, would study it to obtain guidance in religious matters rather than to seek it in the Bible and from the leading of the Spirit of God. Is that happening today? Is the manual put forward before the Bible in many cases? You remember when Danny Shelton was disfellowshipped from the Gulf? Sorry, Danny Vieira was... Um, it's good we've got twins to help each other out on this. <laughs> um, when Danny Vieira was disfellowshipped from the Gulf Church in California and the president of the the Northern California Conference, now the division president, um, was in the chair. And partway through it, he asked for the manual, and Danny, Danny immediately gave him his Bible. And the president said, no, I didn't ask for the Bible, I asked for the manual. 
And Danny said, that is our manual. That is our manual. It didn't make any difference in the situation. Um, and now, so if we had one, we fear that many, especially those commencing to preach, would study to obtain guidance in religious matters rather than to seek it in the Bible and from the leading of the Spirit of God, which would tend towards their hindrance in genuine religious experience and in knowledge of the mind of the Spirit. It was in taking similar steps that other bodies of Christians <coughs> excuse me, first began to lose their simplicity and become formal and spiritually lifeless. You see, the manual had made them spiritually lifeless. Why should we imitate them? The committee feels, in short, that our tendency should be in the direction of the policy and close conformity of the Bible, rather than to elaborate defining every point in the church management and church ordinances. How wise they were. Go back to the Bible. Don't depend upon a man-made document. Depend upon a God-made document. Well, one week later, November 27, 1883, the General Conference President wrote what I believe was the most prophetic utterances that I've ever read from a non-inspired man. This is the center of what he wrote against the church manual. Now, I want you to listen to this carefully. Tell me if all these things have not happened in the Seventh-day Adventist church be since we've had a manual. When brethren... By the way, the last statement he made shows he wasn't a prophet. You'll see that too. When brethren who have favored a manual have even contended that such a work was not to be anything like a creed or a discipline or to have any authority to settle disputed points but was only to be considered as a book containing hints for the help of those of little experience yet it must be evident that such a work issued under the auspices of the general conference would at once carry with it much weight of authority and would be consulted by most of our young ministers that's a long sentence but it's a powerful sentence he said, look, you say it's only going to be hints. It's only going to be guidelines. But because it'll be printed by the General Conference, it will immediately assume great authority. Now, there was the General Conference with a, with a deep understanding. <coughs> and he says, it, was gradually sh it would gradually shape and mold the entire body. And those who did not follow it would be considered out of harmony with established principles of church order. Oh, has that happened today? And really, is this not the object of a manual? What would be the use of one if it did not accomplish such a result? <coughs> but would the result on a whole be a benefit? Would our ministers be broader, more original, more self-reliant men? Would they be better depended on in great emergencies? Would their spiritual experience likely be deeper and their judgment more reliable? We think the tendency all the other way. We have preserved simplicity and have prospered in so doing. It is best to let well enough alone. For these and other reasons, the church manual was rejected. I wish he was accurate in the last sentence. It is probable that it will never be brought forward again. 1883, 49 years later, the church manual concept was voted under the leadership of Elder Charles Watson. It's been downhill all the way. Have you ever, how many have got, have ever seen a 1934 manual? That was really the first time it came out. How many have ever seen the first manual? It's 19, I've got one, but 1932. Yeah, 32, yes. I have a copy of it too. I would ask anyone to compare the 1932 manual with the 2000 manual. You'd almost think you were looking at a different document. I wrote after the 2000 General Conference session that more than 80 changes had been made in the church manual 
at the 2000 session. I had a man quite angrily write to me, basically saying, I don't believe you, you prove it to me. So we had all the minutes of the 2000. I said to Brother Mayor, please go through this and find all the changes that were made. After he'd gone through nearly three quarters of it, he called me up, he said, I'm over 600 changes now that were made in 2000. He said, do you want me to carry on? I said, don't bother. Now, all I was saying, 80 major changes. There are some that are more editorial, but I tell you, the manual that I have, the infallible word of God, hasn't changed since I first read it. So I said to Brother Mayor, I said, look, call up the General Conference, find out who was the one that inputted all the changes into the 2000 manual, and please ask how many changes actually be made. So I eventually found the lady that had inputted all of them. And Brother Mayor asked her, how many changes? She said, oh, I've got no idea. It was hundreds upon hundreds of them. I believe it was probably close to 800 changes. It had to be at least up around 700. We didn't go to the rest. We've never counted the rest of them. Now, can you see? Where, look, how can it be? Russell and I were baptized in 1950. We were just short of our 17th birthday by a week or two when we were baptized in this faith. If the manual is our basis of faith and practice, and if we had made a covenant to follow that manual, that would be like giving someone a blank check. Every time it changed, we got to bow down and say, fine, next time it changes, fine, the next time it changes, fine, when we were at the general conference, when they were uh, hitting us hard over our stand against the 27 fundamental beliefs. In the end, I turned to them and I said, Brethren, why are you hammering us over the 27 fundamental beliefs? Why not over the 28 um, beliefs that are in the back of the manual, uh, the church manual? There wasn't one of those leaders, including the General Conference Vice President who was chairing that, that had any idea there were two quite distinct sets of beliefs in the same church manual, the 27 at the front and the 28 fundamental beliefs at the back. And one of the men, the president of the Inter-American Division said, what's the 28th? I said, Elder, it's not a, another additional one, it's a whole different set of beliefs. By the way, a much better one than there is at the front. And the, the, the vice president said, has anyone got a manual here? Well, someone, of course, had a manual. It wasn't from any of our, none of our people had a manual with us, but, and they passed it to him, and he found the second one. Well, he was humble enough to say, I'm learning things. Now, they're telling us we've got to follow the church manual, we've got to be loyal to the church manual. They don't even know what's in that church manual. We knew actually better than they did what was in the church manual. I tell you, that stopped that discussion. We went on to another discussion. Sometimes you've got to be straight up front. These men don't even know what they're talking about. That's what's happening. Brethren, the manual, never allow this to become your basis. I'm not saying there aren't some good things there, but it's not the basis of a Seventh-day Adventist faith or practice. As I listen to this, you know, uh, Colin, I remember you and I were sitting together when the 27 beliefs were stuck. Oh. We discussed. We couldn't, we were shaking our heads. We Russell was a delegate at that. At yeah. that um, but we, we sat together there when one of our comrades, uh, Ralph Larson, rose up because of some of the problems that were in that on the nature of Christ and, the, and the atonement. Time. I mean, it wasn't drawn clear enough. And he, may, he had permission to make a speech and, tell, and ask that this could be put on hold till more uh, study could go into it. And the General Conference President nailed him down. Oh, it was horrible. I went to the General Conference President afterwards and said, because I was at the General Conference, I said, please, that what you did here 
was, I mean, you've left the impression that this man didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, you need to make an amends at, right now over this whole situation. Well, he walked away from me and he said, well, you tell uh, Ralph Larson, you know, that I'm sorry. He walked away from me. But now as we begin to... But to wait a minute. It was so bad that in the afternoon, the delegates voted to expunge that from the record. So you'll never find that in the general conference, what took place. That's how bad the altercation was because there was a determination that no matter what to vote those 27 fundamentals. It was terrible. But anyway, uh, you know, as I look at ourselves here, the three of us, God knew us before we were born. He already had a plan for us. We didn't know it. Jeremiah had a plan for his life before he was born. We're not here standing up and say, you know, we're great preachers, or we're great researchers, or whatever. We're here because God chose us. Amen. And that's, you know, there's nothing more awesome to me than to be chosen by God. What do you say? I know I was chosen by God in my feebleness, in my, all, all my mistakes, in the patience that God has had with me. I was chosen by God. And let me tell you, friends, if it takes my life, I will stand true, not by what I do, but what I believe God will do in me, but I must let him do it every day. Now, Russell, if you'll bring us to, to the, your part. Well, let me say, Colin and I have both been delegates to the General Conference, Colin, in 1975, myself in 1980, and again in 1990. We're not counting on being selected yet another time. <laughs> But that outburst against Pastor Larson on the grounds that he wasn't a delegate, he wasn't a delegate, he had no right to vote in those circumstances, but as a faithful pastor he had every right to give that counsel. And he wanted to wait for five years because most of us as delegates, we got the uh, new statement, 27, and we had a few moments to read it before the, uh, not before the vote, but before the discussion on the vote. Now I made, and I hope none of you in similar circumstance, if you're ever put in these positions, I made a monumental blunder. I read it through very quickly, trying to find anything I disagreed in it. Look, the devil works much more subtly than that. It was only as I read it in peace and quiet, Later, I realized what had happened. It was a pluralistic, a pluralistic statement. Right. It wasn't so much what it said, it's what it deliberately omitted to say. For example, of course it said God created the world in six days. But the big issue was, was it did, created about 6,000 years ago or, or much older? And you know that's a huge issue right now. Shocking. Shocking issue. Till the point you can hardly find even a so-called faithful theologian or sign who will say it's about six years ago. The Adventist Theological Society is changing or attempting to change in uh, I think it's October they t or November they take the vote and the suggestion is that they take out the 6,000 years and just say a short chronology. My dear brothers and sisters, that is like saying Sister White, who 42 times says that the earth is about 6,000 years old, <coughs> and 41 times referring to the first Adventist, uh, Advent states about, uh, that it is 4,000 years approximately since creation. So that's a total of 83 divine statements at this earth is 6,000, because if you say 4,000 at Christ, approximately 4,000 at Christ's birth, you know there's been 2,000 years past, so that's the same as saying 6,000. Now, I would require only one divine statement Amen. to tell me, but 83 shows how important it is. And on the nature of Christ, it said he came as a human being. No question about that, but no mention of the fallen nature. So that these faithless 
theologians in our church can say, well, I agree with that fundamental, you see. And so that is the error. And make no mistake, it is now a creed in our church. Let me tell you, within two months of that general conference, I was back in Australia. The field secretary of the South Pacific Division stood up at a forum meeting. You know what these Adventist forums are. I hope you do. They're the liberal agenda of our church, commenced here in North America, and they've been uh, spawned to Australia. And uh, he stated this. He said, since a couple of months ago, the vote taken there uh, in Dallas, in Texas, General Conference, we do not have to believe that there's a two-apartment sanctuary in heaven, for it is not designated in the fundamental beliefs. My dear brothers and sisters, it's in my creed. The two-apartment sanctuary in heaven is well and truly in the creed that I follow. And I have no um, <coughs> qualms in believing we must have a creed. And this is it. We have to have a creed, but not a man-made creed. You probably, I think he said it more than once, heard the former General Conference President, Robert Falkenberg, state, you cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist unless you affirm the 27 fundamentals. That is creedalism of the worst order. I say, my dear brothers and sisters, you cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist until you believe every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Amen. God. Amen. Then you are, I say, believe and practice, of course. Amen. You are a Seventh-day Adventist. We have a creed, just as Elder Butler feared we would get. And we got it. We've got it today. And having sat through the atmosphere, the only word I could use of um, Pastor Neil Wilson's attack at that general conference on uh, uh, Dr. Larson, Ralph Larson, is to say it was the worst tirade I've ever heard in a meeting in Seventh-day Adventism. It was dreadful. And I just felt sick when they came back as if they were doing Dr. Larson a favour and saying, well, we don't want him to have any uh, aspersions placed on him. Will you vote to have it expunged from the record of the general conference session. So don't go to the review to find that. It was expunged, the whole terrible tirade. But I'm here as a first-hand a first -hand witness which would stand credibly in a court of law to say it happened, and you've got two other men here who heard it too. I and a similar tirade with Russell Ball in April 5 and 6, 2000 against us. That was in a private meeting, yes. yes. I want to say that that manual has been the destruction of our church. I'll only speak very briefly about the formation of the seminary. It, didn't, it wasn't formed at that time, but the decision was made to form a seminary. And we eventually got the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Seminary, which was in the General Conference originally. That's where Des Ford went to do his master's degree under Edward Heppenstall. And Colin did mention yesterday about people stating that uh, European theologians um, destroyed our faith. But he pointed out that it was being destroyed by Americans back in the 1919 Bible Conference, and that is true. But the incredible thing is there's something in the psyche of Americans that think that British trained theologians are more erudite, that, uh, that uh, European trained theologians are more erudite. That's why they brought out Hans La Rondelle, who is Dutch, uh, and Raoul Dederen, who is uh, Belgian, and uh, Edward Heppenstall, who was English, and so it came on. Who was English? Pardon? Yes, um, uh, Professor Vick, another Englishman, and so forth. And you go to, and you find so many of these men. But you know, when you're trained, as our General Conference President has been trained, in the University of Tübingen in Germany, the most liberal 
um, Protestant university of theology that you could ever imagine is to be near the border with uh, France. Uh, I want to tell you, this is no place to learn to preach truth. Let us never forget it. Because these European theological institutions, Des Ford got his doctorate over there in, in England, in the University of Manchester, they're filled with liberal theology, even worse than the churches. When you have um, a nation like Britain where 32 out of 43 surveyed bishops of the Anglican Church declared that Christ was not born of a virgin, 32 out of 43, and where he wasn't bodily taken to heaven, you know what the state of the um, Church of England is, or what you call the Episcopalian Church, what we call the Anglican Church in Australia. Same thing. My dear brothers and sisters, we need to be studying the truth. And that's where accreditation has had the most dire effects. Now, the reason that accreditation was sought, all those general conference men, every last one of them, knew and knew 100% certainly that that was going to be a very dangerous course. But they said, if we don't do this, we don't get accreditation for our pre-med courses and our pre-dentistry courses. I, I don't think they'd started dentistry then, but the pre-medical courses, then our doctors, when they do medicine, will not be recognized in America. Well, I thought Harvard doctors, physicians were recognized. Harvard doesn't bother. It's a sign uh, with accreditation. It's a sign of our inferiority. How can an educational system, which is to present God and to follow books like education and councils to parents, teachers and students and councils on education and so forth, fundamentals of Christian education, those wonderful books, how can we yield to accreditation? Colin can tell you some stories when he was president of Columbia Union College, it nearly drove him insane, was that accreditation process. We need to be accredited by the Lord of heaven. Amen. That's the accreditation we need. It's not a sign of inferiority, make no mistake. Amen. Not a sign of inferiority. And I'm so pleased that Heartland Institute or college was based upon non-accreditation. Look, many of the courses at uh, Stanford University uh, down uh, there in California are not accredited. And I tell you, you do not need accreditation. And, and Heartland stands without accreditation. And God has blessed so wonderfully. I think Yale and, and Harvard don't have accreditation. I don't know about Yale, but uh, maybe you're right. But Harvard certainly doesn't. It doesn't fulfill the criteria. It uses too many of its own graduates because it knows they're the best in their own mind, that is. And it doesn't bother with such things. And yet no one goes around and saying, oh, well, he went to an unaccredited college, didn't he? You know, let's, let, let us get wise. We, God had a way and Amen. we lost our faith. Amen. We lost our faith. And that was a terrible trouble because what we now have is professors trained in the colleges of the world who come back and bring what Pastor Pearson in his farewell address as General Conference President just before he retired, he said uh, that they were bringing back Babylonish ideas and uh, placing them as if they were truths of God. And he cried out, don't let it happen. Andrews University. Don't let it happen. Loma Linda University. Could have mentioned every other tertiary institution that we had. But despite his plea, it has happened. And now we have evolutionists everywhere. While we have been attending this holy convocation here, just yesterday, the 17th day of July, at Avondale College in Australia, they commenced hosting 
the Theistic Evolution Congress of Australia in our college, at Avondale College. It's all on the internet, on the websites, and that is a division institution, therefore culpable is the chairman of that board, the president of our South Pacific Division. My dear brothers and sisters, this is where we are in Australia. Sure. Further, furthermore, they're trying to get Des Ford, who started off with just saying, well, it's maybe eight to 10,000 years old, maybe eight, this world. Now he's saying it's millions of years. Now he's saying the world was not created in six days, wasn't it? Then God is a downright liar, for with his own finger he said when he wrote the fourth commandment, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that is. That is a direct accusation against our God. Furthermore, it's an accusation against the Bible because Titus 1-2 tells us God cannot lie. Well, if it was not created in six days, then God can lie. And then you've lost the Sabbath. There is no other reason for the Sabbath than the fact that God created the earth in six mm -hmm. literal days. We see the time, brother, we've seen it. May God remind you that that little fudge, every time, my dear brothers and sisters, you hear someone who is standing for truth in most ways about creation and says, I believe in a short chronology. Hold it. He doesn't. He must believe what God says, that the earth is about 6,000 years old. Amen. That is shorthand for saying, I don't believe it's millions of years. That's how Ford started off but I know it's only a few thousand years longer. Brothers and sisters, 6,000 approximately. 83 divine statements, and if you go through the chronologies of the Bible, you come to the same conclusion. Amen. Usher may not be right to the last day, but he was in general right when Amen. he came to that chronology. Brothers and sisters, 1937, after we took accreditation, you know, was the first time that at Loma Linda, some of the physicians and the professors started to speak of the long chronology theory. I've just been reading the history of it because I'm writing these matters up in our new book. 1937, these faithless theologians and faithless scientists still pretending to believe in Seventh-day Adventism are destroying the spirit of prophecy, making of none effect. And even those who are saying it's still a short chronology, it's just like those who say, and I hope none of us do it, the author of Hebrews, immediately you know the person who said that doesn't believe the spirit of prophecy because over and over again, Sister White says, Paul wrote Hebrews, the author. You don't say Paul you don't say the author. Those are those who do not believe the spirit of prophecy. They brought that terminology in. Brothers and sisters, we're different. We believe the spirit of prophecy. Paul wrote it. We're not going to be agnostic over who the author. It's yeah. a different thing if you say the author of the Psalms because there are several authors and you may have forgotten which one it was when, <laughs> when you are quoting. But Hebrews is different. Paul wrote Hebrews. I... You know, uh, friends, I want to weep over all this. What a tragedy we're in. Nobody seems to know the truth anymore. And you people, he's sitting here. How much do you know? And how much are you ready to share with the world around you and the church that you're in? God help us now. We're at the final hours of the history of the great controversy. Jesus is soon to come. Probation is about to close. And there's going to be very few Seventh-day Adventists saying, what a tragedy. She says, only a few, only a few, only a few. Colin. Just wondering what I can say to um, tie this off. 
today, we would have spent more time on the accreditation issue. As an educator, that's very important to me. Um, and that was one of the two questions I asked when I was invited to be the foundational president of Heartland. Will the board promise me that under no circumstances they will put pressure on to be accredited because I want to listen to one voice and one voice alone and that's the voice of God. Amen. Brethren, you can't have the two. There'll be educators that say they don't affect you the way you um, project your philosophy. That's nonsense. The people of the world can't think like the people of God. It's impossible. And having been the president of an accredited college in Columbia Union College, I would never again wanted to have anything to do with accreditation. And I thank the Lord that in the 20 years of Heartland, there has never been one little bit of pressure put on to accredit. We've got a wonderful board of directors that believe that we follow God and his word, and that's all we need to follow. I was talking to our sister over here in the front yesterday after the meeting, and we were talking a little about the hope that we have. Our sister's a new Adventist, but she has been thrilled by what she's been hearing here, and she's acknowledging that now. And as we spoke together, I said, the hope is that all this tells us just how close we are to the return of Jesus. Yes. And we were rejoicing together in the fact that everything that is happening has been foretold in the prophets. Amen. So we're not discouraged. Amen. We're not despondent. We're not losing our faith. We're not losing our trust. In fact, it strengthens our trust and it drives us back to our Savior. You see, that is our only hope. To trust in the arm of flesh is to trust in fallible humanity. And I believe, brethren and sisters, if we were following a man, even if he never once presented any error whatsoever, we'd still lose eternity because we were... What is Jeremiah 17, 5? We're under a curse. That's right. We're under a curse because we're following a man and not following Jesus. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful statement? That's a command, actually, yeah. uh, as well as a, a very promise because he's the author and finisher Amen. of our faith. Amen. There's only one person. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby Amen. we Amen. shall be saved. Yeah, and that is Jesus. Brilliant. It's just so wonderful to have our trust in him. Look. This game, it's, the, the bad news is it's going to get worse. The servant of the Lord says apostasy shall increase until the close of probation. That's right. I thought 20 years ago it couldn't get any worse. And uh, how foolish I was. I don't make those statements anymore. And the word of scripture, it's going to get worse. But the division between God's faithful people um, is so important. We ran out of time. To us and um, so we have to look to Jesus we've got books that that are so essential to read we didn't write them to have sitting in storehouses and that's true of Elder Spears he's got his two yeah. latest books have you all got copies of these latest books I mean um, tell them briefly about well, them you know I don't write books you know I compile books because I don't consider myself a writer. But I sit down to my desk at 4 o'clock or whatever in the morning and ask God to lead, and this is what happened, these two books. You can, you, you can, if you buy a box of them and distribute them out, you can buy them uh, at a special price. Uh, if you talk to, the, to, to my boss, the administrator, Joe Olson. <laughs> but, um, let me tell you, folks, we're at the end of it. I, I tell you, we're at the end of it. And what we do from this time on, we've got to learn self-denial and sacrifice, and we're not going to make it. We can have it all in our heads, but if we don't share it, we're lost. Now, 
I think you need to talk to Joe because I'm not going to give you any prizes. It's up to him to make that decision. But we want these books out. We put out 9,000 of this book here and several thousand of this one. But listen, we're at the end of it, folks. And the, uh, one of these days you're going to walk up and find out your money in the bank ain't worth anything. Let's learn self-denial and sacrifice. It's time for prayer. Russell, will you pray for us? Father in heaven, we thank thee that we have not come to this tragic period of earth's history without thou mm -hmm. having sent us mm -hmm. very precise warning so that we might understand the very times in which we're living. O oh Lord our God in ages past, Amen. our hope for years to come. Amen. Lord, that is the years of eternity. Amen. And we pray that every dear brother and sister and child here will find their eternal home Amen. and help us to be alert, to be true witnesses. Give us, each one, the courage of heroes and the faith of martyrs. This is our prayer in thy holy name. Amen. Amen.